Wow. Did you see that? The real professor. Oh, my God. And that's not even all. I'm also a chemist, a toxicologist, take up phone calls. I'm a science officer. But you guess what? I just gave it up last year. I stopped with it. The reason is, and I'm going to take you to the story, is I want to innovate. I want to connect people. I want to connect disciplines. And with that, there's energy coming in. This energy, I tend to describe as a nuclear fusion, because that's what happens in my brain when I connect different things and different people. The energy gives me the inspiration to move ahead. Now, let me take you back to where it starts. Our society is now, it's boosting. Our economy is boosting. Because consumer trust is increasing. Unemployment rates are decreasing. And nevertheless, we feel like large organizations say, we need new people, we need innovative people. But how do we get innovative people? It means you have to have an innovative organization. And how do you keep up with an innovative organization? And that seems to be such a difficult question. Why do you want this? So the vision is, yeah, do I need to be competitive to my, the other companies? Can I only be innovative if I am part of that ecosystem, the campus or whatever? Or is it simply my profile as a company that if I am innovative, I can hire innovative people and maybe I become innovative? So what they do, large corporates, they send out their managers, they send out people and tell everybody else, we are the most innovative. And maybe that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then you can hire the people and you may get innovative. That's not reality. Innovation is a struggle and a battle at the same time. It's horrible. It's horrible to be in an innovative process because all your certainties are gone. And we think we can inno innovate because we are limited. So we, we even organize TEDx meetings. We have hubs, we have trainings, we have boot camps. More phone calls coming in. Innovation means you have to get out of your comfort zone. So what's your comfort zone? You already came here, fine, but you're still nice in your suite. Innovation only is happening when you are in the middle of it. You have to be part of it. Get out of that comfort zone. And the result, I can tell you, as happened to me, is unexpected. It's like a nuclear fusion. There's an enormous energy release. It's uncontrollable and it's unimaginable. And let me take that last word, unmanageable. Because managers, and we have lots of them, I don't know how many of you here are, I can't see you guys. But we have so many managers and they grow well on stability and control. Now, you can see the paradox between innovation, stability and control. So managing innovation doesn't work. Not as we think it should be done. Managers want to keep their people in control. If you are a free thinker like me, you want to move ahead, do something stupid, they will say, hey, you have to perform better, more into the lines where we set, and they put you on a personal efficacy course or something. That's what happens. Now, let me tell you a bit about my explosions, because if that energy has to stay inside, and you're in academia, in my case, it didn't work out. So, more explosions. The biggest explosion occurred when I met people from the field of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is something that made me realize that we have physics, biology, we have mathematics, chemistry. It's basically all the same thing. The only thing that we are doing at schools, academia, is organize these disciplines in such a way that you can handle it. 
nice pigeonholes, the same science. And in that science field, you can talk to each other, but don't try to cross-talk with other scientific fields. These are three people that managed to get out of the pigeonhole. Niels Bohr, Max Planck, and Einstein, most of you will know. They knew, or they supposed, they didn't knew, they just supposed there, that materials and energy are the same thing. So material can transfer into energy and the other way around, depending on speed and, and mass. They made a change to the world. I want to take you to a couple of examples in nanotechnology, and I hope you'll also get inspired by the idea that materials can change properties, although we are talking about the same material. So gold suddenly becomes another gold, but it's still gold. First example here is the sugar lump. The sugar lump here, if I divide it up, it has sides of about one square centimeter, Total surface of the sugar lump here on the outside is six square centimeters. As you can see here. I've, if I divide that up into little pieces, then I go to 60 square centimeters. If I make the pieces even smaller, then I end up with a sugar lump of one gram, which has an internal or an external surface area of about 60 million square centimeters. So that simple same mass of one gram suddenly has another mass. What does that mean? Well, the surface connects to the environment. So, in chemistry, people know this large surface is very useful in the reactivity of a compound. So, for catalysts in chemistry, this is, this is beautiful. Next example. This is almost like high school chemistry. Sorry for that. It tells you a, a compound TiO2 titanium dioxide. It's a compound which is used in, you probably had it this morning, it's in toothpaste. It's white, it's a powder, and if it's in powder, you can see it on the electron microscope like this. Those are micrometer particles. If you go down the size of nanometers, like thousandfold smaller, there comes a moment when the structure of the particle can no longer accommodate titanium and oxygen in the same ratio as titanium dioxide. So the physical boundaries determine the chemistry. So you see, we are crossing disciplines. And you end up with a compound that may actually be like this. This is just an example. Which means it has a reactive surface, because it has no longer its optimal structure. And due to the small physical size, this inert compound totally inert, changes into something reactive. Beautiful picture. Quantum dots. Quantum dots are simply nanoparticles, as you can see, between 4 and 10 nanometers. So it's the same material, but depending on the size, it gives you a different color. And it's not just color. They also have many different properties that are Amazing optical, and they are used now in many diagnostic and quantum chemistry applications. You can also turn the world around. You can say, okay, we have these nice particles, they can do a lot of things, they have new properties. But often, if you look at nature very carefully, you see that compounds are basically built on their own. So these are examples where nanoparticles build their own wall. And here, where proteins find their own structure into a new cell wall. They just know where to go, like you were finding your seed again. They know where to go. Now, let me take you the example of which was the inspiration for my own business, Nano for Imaging. Looking at a rusty bike, and you scrape off the rust, you get this red powder. And if you make that red powder small again, it becomes magnetic which you see here. So it becomes, if you put it in fluid and water, it's black because it's, the light cannot go through. You put a magnet there, and it shows like a high heel magnetic fluid. Now we use that because 
This is magnetic. So if you think it on the other way around, you can use that to disturb a magnetic field. Now here you're looking at an MRI movie in which the black dots you see moving here are basically caused by the iron oxide nanoparticles which are embedded into medical instruments. So here you can see the black dots going into the right renal kidney of a patient. And with this method, we can actually use the MRI, which is usually used as a very expensive photo machine. We can use this MRI to do real-time interventions in people. And the advantage of MRI is that it has no radiation, that you can see the tissue around it, and you don't need any contrast agent. But it takes a transfer to go to that new procedure. More examples, a last example from medical applications, which I was also involved, is that you can, these nanoparticles, they are so small that they actually escape the normal defense system. They're almost as small as a virus, or even smaller. So they can actually get away from the immune system. And if you put something in it there, then you can actually fool the immune system and treat cancer, in this case, liver cancer, much more effectively as you would give the cytostatic drug alone. So a lot of promises there. <clears throat> Back to the explosions. Because why am I here? Why am I telling you this? Why am I, am I teaching you guys nanotechnology? No, sorry. You know what, I can inspire you. The reason is that I think nanotechnology deserves better. Because what I see happening is that nanotechnology will now be embedded nicely in the academic discipline. I think nanotechnology deserves better. Nanotechnology deserves development, further development by, in academia, in business, by free-thinking scientists. Free thinkers, as I call them. Large organizations like universities, business, have major problems with free thinkers. Because they're very hard to embed. And if you embed them for too long time, this happens. So you have the, the explosion. And with the explosion, usually people will leave, as I did from academia. The other side of the coin is that the people that remain, they say, OK, no explosions for me. I'll stay here. So you have an imploded organization, a nano. They say, OK, it's my next job. Good. I want to make a plea for larger organizations, companies, academia, and Netherlands. Use your free thinkers in the innovative process which is all over the organization. Use them, let them go, let them fly, because if you won't do, let them fly, your innovation will die. That's my message. Thank you very much.